somebody give God praise in the room? But I need to hear somebody shout out loud. Come on. There we go. Man, I'm so fired up to be here. Can y'all do something for me? And I know you just got nestled in. Can you stand back to your feet? Maybe you're at home right now watching and you just picked up your bowl of Cheerios. Set it back down for a minute. And would you just lift your hands towards heaven one more time? The Bible says in Matthew chapter 18, verse 19 and 20, that if just two or three of us would show up and gather in his name. How many of y'all came for Jesus today? Now, come on. How many of y'all came because he's been better than good to you? So, Father, in the middle of all of the noise, in the middle of this pandemic, the racial unrest, in the middle of everything happening around us, we lift our voice, we lift our hands as a sign of surrender to you. And with grateful hearts, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for being consistent. Thank you for not running out on us when other people have. I felt that in my spirit. Thank you for staying by our side, that when we lean on your promises, we have confidence that your promises don't break when we lean on them. God, in this moment right now, we're grateful. I just want you to, with your eyes closed for a moment, I want you to begin to go back to some promises that he spoke over you. God, I thank you that in this season, we can recognize that your promises don't have expiration dates on them. That the one who's been standing with us will always be stronger than the one who's been standing against us. That, that all the hell that's been happening around us is no match for the heaven that's inside of us. So God, we honor you and we bless you. We magnify your name. Can you just begin to articulate with your own words how much you love him? Come on, just for a moment. I, I felt a shift as we were worshiping, just, just begin to articulate how much you love him. And if it's just, I love you, then how, it's enough. If, if the only thing you can whisper is the name of Jesus, it's enough. Yeah, yeah. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great Sun to the setting, say, I will bless your name. Great is your faithfulness, because he's a good, good father. It's who you are. Come on, just say, say, it's who. Yeah, yeah. It's who you are, and I'm loved by you. Say, it's who I am. Woo. Come on, let me hear you lead it out. You're a good, good you're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. Come on, as daughters and sons say, it's who I am. It's you one more time. Declare and say, you're a good, good father. To you are. I'm loved by you. I'm by you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Father, right now, we honor you. We bless you. We magnify you. Come on, can somebody give the healer, the restorer, your refuge, your strength, your very present help in a time of need, the praise that he's worthy of. Now, God, throw your weight around the room. Flex. Move like only you can move. Let miracles break out. Let signs and wonders break out. Let breakthrough begin to breathe into this room. There's a song um, that Matt, Matt's been traveling with me for a long time, and, and I'll jump in. Some of y'all are like, is this what he's going to do all day? Just give me a second. Let me say this. I was telling the team in the back, like we, we haven't had one of these in-person gatherings since March because in Houston, Texas, y'all, we still can't gather like this. And so just being in a room that looks like heaven, multi-generational and multicultural, I, I, I'm sorry, maybe this is just for me, but I needed to be in this moment with you. 
And you know, I believe with all my heart that the best days for the church, the big C church, the, the best days for word of life, the best days for where God is about to breathe and take this church is not behind us, y'all. I, I believe where God is about to take us, there's greater miracles, there's greater breakthrough, there's greater deliverance. But there's a song um, that I've been singing for years. Some of y'all probably already know it. And it says, uh, you're never going to let, you're never going to let me down. Come on, do y'all believe that? You're never going to let, you're never going to let me down. Oh, oh, oh. You're never going to let, you're never going to let me down, Jesus. You're never going to let. You'll never, cause you are good, say, because you are good, say, you're good. Yeah, 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 say, you are, you are good, you are good, oh, oh, you are good, you're good, oh, oh, you are good. Come on, one more time with your hands lifted from the top of your lungs in your home. See, you're never going to let me down, say, you're never going to let. Never have, you never will, say. Oh, oh. Come on, because I know you're fighting for me. Shout it out, say, you're never going to let. Every day of my life, you're. Yeah, you're never gonna let me down. Now the Bible says we're just flowing for a minute. Is that okay? Can we get, thank you for your overwhelming enthusiasm. It is okay. Is it okay if we just flow for a minute? Two verses that I have they've been an anthem for a long time in my, my personal journey and my family's journey. But first Peter 5, verse 6 says this: it says, Humble yourself. See, that's a choice. Another translation says, position yourself under the mighty hand of God. And it says this, that he will lift you up. You know, maybe you've lost your job. Maybe financially this, this pandemic, this situation we've been in has affected your finances. Maybe, maybe your marriage feels like it's falling apart. Maybe there's been chaos in your family dynamic. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Position yourself, posture yourself under the mighty hand hand of God and he will lift you up. And then the very next verse, 1 Peter 5 verse 7 says, in casting all your cares. Come on, see in our humanity, we like to compartmentalize. Like God, I trust you with all this, but I'll fix all this. So some of you, God's been asking you to release it because you know you're not built or you weren't created to carry this. The stress, the concern, the anxiety, the panic attacks, the fear, all of it. Cast your cares on the Lord because he cares for you. The Lord at the very beginning of this year, and I didn't realize it would be such a prophetic declaration for us as a church and in my family. I heard the Lord, let me tell you a backstory of why it happened. So I'm, I'll introduce my family in a moment, but my little boy Brecken came over to me this, this one night and he asked me to take care of something for him. And he was 10 at the time. And I said, I, I've got it. And to him, it was a big deal. But in his father's hands, it wasn't that big of a deal. So at 10 years old, he says, we Will you pray? Will you help me? I said, well, I'll just take care of it. And he's like, what do you mean? I was like, I got you. He's like, what? I was like, I got you. So we do a little handshake. He's like, ah, he walks out. I was like, okay, cool. The next morning, true story, 5.30 a.m., I come downstairs before everything's binging and dinging and ringing. I try to spend a little time with the Lord, and I come downstairs to get some coffee, and Brecken is in the kitchen wiping down the counter. I'm like, buddy, what are you doing? He's like, I'm just trying to get some cleaning done. I mean, it's 5.30 in the morning. I said, I'm proud of you. Let me show you how to do the toilets too. I have no idea why you're so excited about this. And he said, hey, uh, I just wanted to know if you, if you remember yesterday, if you remember, he was checking back to see if I had followed through. And it was just, it was still so consuming to him. I said, buddy, I gave you my word. I will take care of this. And he said, okay, okay. Three hours later, his sister Finley walks in. She's like, what's up, Dad? I'm like, hey, baby, do a little spin, dip, bro. I was like, what's going on? And she said, do you remember Brecken? I was like, what do you mean do I remember? Bre Your brother? Yes, I remember. She's like, oh, no, no. Do you remember when Brecken asked you yesterday and this morning? I said, bro, you sent a spy into the camp? Like, 
See, he couldn't trust that what I said would come to pass. And I said, Brecken, I gave you my word. And this is the honest God truth. I felt the Holy Spirit check me. The Bible says in John chapter 14, verse 26, that before Jesus ascended to sit at the right hand of the Father, he left the Holy Spirit here as our comforter, our helper who helps to remind us of all the things that were spoken. And so I heard the Holy Spirit check me and said, don't yell at him. You do this to me all the time. I was like, not me, God. Maybe Jackie does, but not. And the Lord said, every time you play something in my hands, you like to do the check back. Hey, hey, God, do you remember me? Like, I even gave a little bit this week. Hey, do you remember me? And God said, stop monitoring the things that you've placed in my hands. Because I can fix it. I can heal it. I can restore it. As we shift into another flow here in just a moment, would you do that for the next two minutes? Would you just begin to cast some cares? Some of y'all have not had a good night's sleep in a while, and I heard the Lord say, the rest is coming over your home. Some of you, I said this a moment ago, you feel like your marriage is falling apart, and God says it's going to fall into place. Come on. Some of you have been walking through some stuff that you cannot figure out how to fix on your own, and God said, just put it in my hands. Would you just place it in his hands right now? Come on. Open-handed. Would you just begin to cast your cares on the Lord right now? Because he is good. He is good. You are good. You're good. Oh, come on. You are good. Just tell him. You're good. Oh, you are good. Yeah, you're good. Oh, oh, oh. you are good. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Now, come on. I think the band's going to support me. Say this out. Say, you're never going to let. Now, let me hear you shout it out like you believe it. Say, yeah, that's good. You're never. Come on, all the way up to the balcony from the top of our lungs. Say, you're never going to let. You're never going to let me down. Oh, oh, oh. You're Come on, one more time. Can we do it as an anthem of praise? Never gonna let me down. Say, you're, you're fighting for me. Come on, one more time. You are good. You are good. Say. Oh, you are good. You are good. Oh, 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 you are good. Yeah, yeah. So good to me. You are good. You're good. Come on. all over the room because he is faithful because he is mighty in Jesus name amen thank y'all listen give somebody a COVID air high five come on give them a COVID air high five and y'all can be seated can you give the worship team a hand as well man I am blown away blown away by what God is doing here thanks man I'm good man I am uh for those of you who, uh, I got a great introduction, I appreciate that, if we have not had the privilege of meeting. Uh, my name is Daniel Groves, I'm based out of Houston, Texas, out of a church called Hope City Church, and uh, man, God has been breathing and moving in that area, and even in the middle of the pandemic and everything that's going on, we have still continued to push back against the kingdom of darkness. We just crossed over two million meals that we've been serving families and kids and those who have been in a financial struggle during this season. And it's been amazing what God has been doing. Pastor Jeremy Foster and his wife Jennifer planted this church five years ago. And uh, five years later, we have five going on six campuses. And uh, in the middle of all of this, y'all, we're still continuing to move forward. Amen. We're continuing to move forward and show people that Jesus is still bigger than COVID. Come on. Jesus is still bigger than the racial dynamics and things that we're dealing with in the country. And so it's hot. I, I landed here yesterday and I fell at home. I started putting deodorant. <laughs> it's, like, it just, it's hot. Like it's hot here. How I many of y'all love the heat? 
Woo, amen. I was going to say, if somebody lifts their hands, I'm going to say, you're lying to me right now. Uh, I have been married to an amazing Amazing woman for 16 years. I think we have my family's picture. We're going to throw it up. Yes, there's my amazing family. She is not Photoshopped. I really did marry way out of my league. <laughs> like, and this is my amazing family. I got my boy Brecken, Finley down here, Daphne at the bottom, and then our new little buddy, Fox, who has my similar look, and you can tell he loves pictures. Uh, my wife is amazing. Uh, 16 years, y'all. We celebrated this summer. Come on, that's pretty, that's pretty awesome. See, if you knew my journey... Some of y'all are like, well, he's kind of passionate. You can't judge my passion until you know where I came from. Uh, my family, I was born in an accident into a drug dealer's house. Uh, my dad was a raging alcoholic full of struggles and violence. And I'm born into this messy Jerry Springer sort of atmosphere. And my mom, who was contemplating in between doctor appointments, had kept telling my dad, like, hey, I'm going to follow through on the abortion. I'm going to some of y'all like, what happened? Well, I made it. I'm not a hologram. I'm here. Amen. But my mom decided to, decided to follow through and, and have me. And, but in the middle of her being pregnant, a drunk driver hit her on the right side and almost killed both of us. And at six months pregnant, she slipped and fell down some stairs and broke her back while holding onto her stomach. See, the enemy was gunning for me when I didn't have a voice. But now in my bizarre kind of dress pants and my Air Force Ones, y'all, I'm kicking the devil in the teeth. So I'm passionate about worship. I'm passionate about the local church because the truth is I never should have made it. How many of y'all, that's your story? I mean, when Marvin Sapp dropped that song, never should have made it, that was my anthem. Never could have made it without you. I would have lost it all. But now I see you were there for me. And I say I'm White people are like, I don't know this song. Just take it easy, y'all. <laughs> I never should have made it, but my mom found Jesus in a grocery store in cereal aisle number 12 when a 73-year-old lady woke up that day and realized, I still have healing in my hands. I still have a word and season on my lips. Thank God for people that still talk about Jesus. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, where the salt of the earth talks about us being the light of the world. This woman walks up to my mom and says, I don't know you, but God has an amazing plan for your kids and your life. And my mom said, get away from this lady. Because <laughs> people like us didn't believe in God. People like us didn't go to church. People like us were broken and messy. And the lady invited my mom to a local church uh, uh, gathering. And the, my mom said, people like us don't go to church. And she said, what do you mean? And she said, like messed up, broken, really messy people. My husband might beat up somebody at the church. And the lady said, so you're not perfect? And my mom said, no, ma'am, far from it. She said, well, that's awesome. Our pastor says no perfect people are allowed. And my mom said, okay, you got me there. <laughs> Six weeks later, my mom, the, the craziness, the addiction, the struggle continued to get worse. And my mom on a Sunday morning got my brother, my sister, my husky little self and said, we're going to church. And my brother said, what's church? And my mom said, I don't know. Let's just go. My mom showed up to this little church with no air conditioning in a small town in Ohio, and the pastor didn't preach religion. That's a waste of time. He preached about relationship with a Savior who had never ran out on her, who had never forsaken her, who could still rescue her. And my mom found Jesus. And man, she came alive. Every Sunday, they would, she'd take us to church. And about three, four years old, they put me up on a chair. And I sang, amazing grace. But I was like, it didn't sound like that. But I would sing every week. And it was amazing what God was doing in her life through this little country church in the middle of this little country town. And the craziness got worse. The chaos got worse. And, and my mom went to the pastor after months and months and months and said, hey, I've been reading this Bible a lot. And it says that I can leave David. He's an adulterer. I feel like my family is just absolutely in shambles. I'm going to move on, okay? And the pastor said, before we do that, and he called his wife over and called some of the elders over, and he said, we're going to pray. And I've got a prayer called the dangerous prayer. And my mom said, hey, hey man, is it going to kill him? Because I, I didn't know y'all had that power because I've got some more people we can pray over. <laughs> and the pastor prayed this prayer, God, whatever bed David's laying in, whatever bar he's sitting in, God, you're not the God of condemnation, but give him a healthy dose of conviction. Romans chapter 2, verse 4 says it's the goodness and love of God that draws a man's heart to a place of freedom. Maybe you're here right now and there's a loved one, a spouse, a family member that's far from God. 
We begin to pray this prayer. And my dad said it was the three hardest weeks of his life. He said he kept feeling the stirring. Every time he would smoke a cigarette, it made him sick. Every time he would drink, it would make him sick. And on a Sunday morning, he woke up and said to my mom, I'm going to go to church with you today. And he put on a John Deere hat and a John Deere vest. Y'all, we didn't know what to do. And he showed up, and the pastor preached a really simple message on the love of God. And my dad walked to the front and started throwing change on the floor. I don't know why he had so much change. I don't know if we were going to the laundromat. There was just so much change. And he's throwing it on the floor, and you could hear it hitting the ground. And my dad, who I'd never seen emotional other than angry, began to cry out, is this enough for my life? Is this enough money for me? I'm a mess. And the pastor said, David, David, look at me. This gift has already been paid for in full. This gift is free because Jesus already covered it. You can pick up all your money and put it in the offering. He didn't say that. He said, you could just, come on, y'all. Are we laughing? Are we allowed to laugh? Is it okay? So he picked up all the money, and my dad went from broken to breakthrough. So my brother's in full-time ministry, my sister. We've seen hundreds of thousands of people impacted by the kingdom because one man decided to give his life to Jesus. And I pray that gives you hope today. I pray that if you have someone in your family that needs deliverance or breakthrough, I prayed that dangerous prayer in a service we were in. It was like a revival night. It was was fire. And this lady walked up to me and she kind of had her finger out. And she said, don't you think that prayer is a little harsh? And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, you're praying that, you know, the people would be convicted. And I said, well, hell's a whole lot worse. She said, pray for my son. He's in jail. (laughs) This is a true story. I said, God, I pray that you would convict him. And she said, yes, Lord, constipate him. I said, don't constipate him. Let me pray. You don't need to. Let me pray. It's a true story. Y'all, we have been in a journey. How many of y'all agree we've been going through some stuff? Come on, as a country, as a people. But I've got great news for you. And I believe the Lord wants to stir something in us today. My wife and I agreed at the very beginning of this pandemic, at the very beginning of all of this, these storms that we're walking through, we agreed to not allow this waiting season to be a wasted season. If you're taking down notes, write that down. I will not allow this waiting season to be a wasted season. Before we jump in and do anything else, I'm blown away by the faithfulness of God. Can we honor your pastors, Pastors Joel and Peppy Sims? God, I just... I'm blown away. We had dinner last night at Pastor Joel and the vision and the fresh wind behind the sails of what God is doing here is absolutely inspiring. Do y'all realize you're smack dab in the middle of a move of God? Again, thank you for your overwhelming enthusiasm. You're right in the middle of heaven touching earth in Jackson, Mississippi, and we're getting caught in between. There's a verse that my wife and I have been uh, living in for the past five months during this pandemic, but We've recognized to not allow the waiting season to be a wasted season. Jesus himself said in John 16, 33, he said, listen, in this life, you're going to go through some things. How many of y'all have gone through some things? Come on. In this life, you're going to go through trials and sorrows of many kinds, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Anything you're walking through, any area of your life that feels like it has no hope has been under the influence of a lie. And the greater one, the king of the world, the one who shaped and molded you and fearfully and wonderfully made you in his image is fighting for you. Exodus 14, 14 says the Lord is fighting for you. Man, I'm grateful I don't have to do this on my own, right? He's fighting for us. It says you just need to be still. But this is a verse that my wife and I have grabbed a hold of like an anthem. It's found in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. And the Amplified says it this way. But those who wait for the Lord. Now, Paul's, but we don't like that. Like in our humanity, like this wait thing is like, oh, man, I got to be patient. Because I don't know about you, but like if I pull up somewhere and they don't have a drive through I'm like, I'm, a, I'm not walking in there. This is craziness. Like, we have a have it your way sort of mentality that's literally Burger King's motto. We have a quick affirmation, instant gratification. In this verse, the Lord is literally saying, but those who wait, that's a choice. But those who position, who posture themselves, watch, it says, who expect, who look for, and hope in him. This part right here blesses me. It says this, it will renew their strength. 
Another version of the Amplified says that it will give you new strength. How many of y'all need new strength in the middle of all of this? Come on, now, now that's all the people that, that said that. How many of y'all really need it? Come on, wave at me. Okay, cool. Brand new strength. Not refurbished, not recycled. You don't have to grab it from yesterday or borrow it from tomorrow. God has brand new strength and great grace for your life today. Everything you need when you need it is found in his presence. The perseverance, the fight, the joy, the mercy, the grace. Come on, the wisdom, the peace. The, everything you need when you need it is found in his presence. Those who wait for the Lord, who expect, who look for, and hope, hope in him will gain New strength. Say new strength. Come on, write that down. Say brand new strength. And then it goes on and says, and it'll renew their power. You know the word renew literally means to restart, to reset, literally to begin again. So my wife and I, in the middle of this, we said, we're not going to allow this waiting season to be a wasted season. We're not going to curl up in a corner and wonder when it's going to end. We're going to rise up and ask God, what are you trying to download in my life in this season? Because I don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss it. I don't want to get three years from now and say, man, I wish I would have leaned in more. I wish I would have pressed in more. I wish I would have spent more time in his presence. I wish I would have been more patient. But how many of y'all are like me in this, that in our human mindedness, sometimes when we feel like something is delayed, we assume it's denied. Like we assume it's denied. Maybe you've been believing God for a miracle in your body and you're like, well, I guess it's just not going to happen. Maybe you've been believing God for a miracle in a situation in your life. I'm asking you to keep on pressing on. Paul said, I have not arrived at my goal just yet, but I choose to press on. This renew is a reset, a restart, a beginning again. My wife and I started walking through a storm a few years ago with her health, and the doctors kept talking about cancer and tumors and multiple appointments and specialists and I remember when we were walking through it, I felt squeezed. How many of y'all have felt squeezed in this season? See, when you're squeezed in life, what comes out of you is what's hidden inside of you. So if you're squeezed and fear and panic and anxiety come out of you, that's been what's been hidden inside of you. I remember feeling squeezed. I remember when the doctor started giving us bleak reports and saying, you're going to deal with this. You're going to have to walk through this. And I remember my wife walking up to me and saying, look at me. God wrapped me up in his presence when I was four years old. I remember his presence coming in my room like a blanket. If he showed up for me before, he's going to do it again. I, that's a prophecy for somebody today. One of the definitions of the word uh, uh, testimony is do it again. If he did it before, how many of y'all God has showed up for you before? And if he did it before, my God is going to do it again. And I remember in the middle of this, for 43 days, we were walking through this journey and I learned patience. I learned new strength. Because yesterday, yesterday's strength didn't cut it for the appointment that we had to walk through today. I, I remember the renewed power. I, I remember reading this and saying, they will lift up their wings and rise up close to God like eagles rising towards the sun. They will run and not become weary. They will walk and not grow tired. God, we need you more than ever. And I'm telling you, every appointment... <laughs> every appointment we would walk in fired up and they'd say, You're, you need to see another specialist. You, you need to walk through this. You need to go see this. And I started feeling weary. But that new strength, that Holy Spirit power, that rejuvenation of his word daily. Y'all, listen, we have treated the presence of God like the glass box on the wall that says break in case of emergency. And more than ever, we need to be in his presence. More than ever, this is our challenge to our church. Take the first 15. The first 15 of every morning, spend time in the word. The first five minutes in the word. The next five minutes, turn on a worship song. Great is your faithfulness. Five minutes, and then five minutes to pray. I know that's not that long, but the first 15. We've been challenging our church by the thousands. First 15, come on, first 15. Get in his presence. We have to get in his presence because what fills, spills. What fills, spills. And I remember on the 43rd day, the night before, and I'm not hyper-spiritualizing this, but on the night before, I was asking God for new strength for the next day. We were seeing the final specialist in this journey that we had been on, and I was doing the dishes like any good husband does. 
And then all the ladies say, amen. <laughs> the guys are like, you have a responsibility to not say those type of things from the mic. I was doing the dishes and I heard the Lord. This is one of the only four or five times that I felt deep reverberation in my spirit. The Lord said, tomorrow you will see the work in my hand. I almost fell out in the kitchen. Because see, I'm a Holy Spirit guy. I, I'm a, I need you more today than I did yesterday and I trust you sort of guy. And I said, God, I need to see the work of your hand. And I went to 1 Samuel and I started reading this story where Samuel piled up stones and they called it an Ebenezer moment. And literally this moment, this monument that he piled up, it means up until this part, Ebenezer, up until this far, God has helped us. And he left it there as a reminder for future generations that come through and see these stones. If God showed up for somebody else, he can do it for us. And I remember waking up the next morning piling up stones, not real stones, like spiritual stones. <laughs> we went to the doctor, and, and I remember that night, again, not hyper-spiritualizing this, not over, not, not like evangelistically speaking, but that night I had a dream. I don't have a ton of dreams, but that night I had a dream where Jackie and I walked in like this revolving door, like one of those fancy hotels, and this revolving door. And I remember seeing this building that we had never been to before. We get in the car, we're driving to the appointment that morning, and as we're pulling up to this doctor's building, right out front, as you walk in, was one of those revolving doors. I said, my God, I could feel his presence already. We begin to walk in, and we went in, and Jackie started to check in, and I begin to say, God, I thank you. That in Isaiah 58, 8, just as sure as the sun will rise, health and strength is springing forth speedily in Jackie's body. Your righteousness goes out in front of your, her and the glory of the Lord overtakes her and has her not only past, her present, but you have her future. And so I begin to pile up stones again. We went in again. We've got new strength for that day. God has renewed our power for that day. We were going to run and not become weary. We were going to walk and not grow tired, and we walked in, and this doctor is from Italy, and I couldn't really understand him, and he begins to talk to us, and he was like, well, should we be? And I was like, mm-hmm, yeah, right, it is a beautiful day, I don't know what he's saying, I'm sorry. And so he began to tell my wife, we need to run more tests, and she's like, well, we've already ran those tests. He treated her like patient number 55732, bedside manner wasn't great. When I tried to shake his hand, he pulled out real quick, and I was like, man, Another one of these days. But I had new strength. We had renewed power. He said, we need to run more tests. We went into the other room, and as he began to run these tests, he said this, hmm, what's blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I said, is it? I don't <laughs> Is it what? And he begins to talk, and I'm like, what's happening? He walks over to my wife, and he starts patting her on the head. Y'all, that's weird, for starters. And I'm sanctified, but I'm like, I don't know why he's patting on my wife's head. I'm... My friend Toby wrote that song, Try Jesus, but don't try me because I throw hands. Okay. <laughs> Toby's a part of our church in Houston, by the way. But I remember standing there with my wife, and he walks over to me, and I could understand this. He said, I don't know what happened up until this moment. When I look at your files, I say multiple tumors, I see inconclusive results. I don't know what happened up until this moment. What I am telling you today is there's no tumors, your blood work is clear, your scans are clear. Y'all, I'm about to run around this building. We begin to walk out and I said to my, see we walked in like this, we walked out like this, like, amen, come on. And as we walked out, I said, step over these stones. And my wife said, what? I said, I piled up spiritual stones right there. The peace of God is in this lobby. We had new strength for that moment. We had renewed power in that moment. And as we're walking back out, true story, we're walking back out that revolving door. As soon as we came outside, we decided to shout out loud. Psalms 100 verse one says, shout for joy all the earth. See, sometimes it's better to shout and give God praise than it does to feel depressed and overwhelmed. And we just begin to shout. There's two times we shout as believers, one for the wall to fall and one after the wall has fallen. So we walked out and we just, hey, and when we did it, there was a lady who had snuck in that little revolving thing with me, which is super awkward. Like if somebody's already in there, don't try to get in there with them. 
So she was in there with me, and we walked out, and I said, hey, and I freaked her out, and she said, oh, Jesus, and I, it's a true story, and I said, do you know him, and she said, who, I'm about to meet him, like <laughs> her heart was raised, true story, and we said, we got a great report, went from broken to breakthrough in one moment, I'm telling y'all, God wants to download new strength today. Just lift your hands towards heaven and just ask him, say, God, I need some new strength. Come on. I need some new strength, not to just survive life, not to just get through it, but to thrive in life. I need some new strength. I need some new strength. I'm going to rush through this very quickly. In this season of waiting, number one, I want to encourage you, don't panic. I know some of y'all are like, that's really easy for you to say. And your polka dot shirts. This is actually flowers. It's scratch and sniff. Number one, write that down. Don't panic. In this season, don't panic. God is in it. He's with you through it. Don't panic. I've been teaching my littlest one who's four. I've been teaching her how to uh, swim lately. And uh, my other ones swim amazing. But Daphne, at three, she just doesn't get it yet. And so... I put on her little floaties, and I said, okay, babe. Now, I don't know how to, like, I'm not like a swim instructor, so if you are, don't at me. I don't know exactly the right phrasing to say, but I said, if you, when you get in, I want you to hold your breath, and she said, okay. And I said, I want you to doggy paddle. She said, puppy paddle. I said, puppy paddle, okay. I want you to kick your feet, because at some point, you may not have these floaties on, and if you ever fall in, what are you going to do? She said, I'm going to hold my breath. I said, hold your breath. What else are you going to do? She said, I want a snack. I said, pay attention. You're going to lock in with me. You go puppy paddle, and then what, what are you going to do? She said, I'm going to kick. I said, you're going to kick. So we were swimming for a while, and she was doing amazing. Well, towards the end of this, my little boy jumped out of the pool, my oldest, and he got hurt. And so I went over, and Daphne was with me with her floaties. Well, she had gotten her clip unclipped and took her floaties off, and I thought she went in the house. So I'm standing there with Brecken, and I'm talking to him, and I was distracted. It's really easy to get distracted. It's really easy to get distracted by all the noise that's happening around us to recognize that the Holy Spirit is always speaking, but it's really easy to get distracted by all the noise around us and panic starts to settle in. And I said, where's Daphne? And Brecken said, I think she went in. And I didn't realize, and I don't know how, for how long, but she had wandered away from me and she had fallen in the deep end. And we had like this little waterfall on and there was lots of music and noise and stuff, so I didn't know that she had fallen in. And I run over and sitting at the bottom of the pool, like, puppy paddling and trying to kick was my little Daphne. Now, I think sometimes we have a misconception of God that says, now, why are you down there? Why are you doing that? I've got great news for you. God's not mad at you. God's madly in love with you. And like a good dad, what did I do? I jumped in. Jumped in. I pulled her up out, and she had her breath held, and she was still trying to puppy paddle and trying to kick me. I said, quit kicking me. Stop quick, quick kick. And I wrapped her up. And she's panicking. I said, babe, babe, look at me. You did great. You did what I said. We got in the house, and she went upstairs, and I broke. I'm standing in the kitchen. I said, babe, I, I just, and Jackie looked at me, and she said, babe, look at me. Daphne did what her father told her last. I believe that's a word for somebody today. Don't panic. Go back and do what the father told you last. What did he tell you he was going to follow through on in your life? What did he say he was going to show up and fight for pre-pandemic, pre-chaos in this earth? What did he say he would do? Go back and do what the Father told you last. The Bible says in Isaiah 41, verse 13, it says, For I am the Lord your God, who takes a hold of your right hand and says to you, Do not fear. Watch this. I will help you. Y'all aren't in this on your own. So number one, say, don't panic. Come on, say it out loud. Number one, don't panic. Number two, he wants to, in this waiting season, he wants to make us better. He wants to make us better. John 15, verse five says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, watch, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. I'm amazed at how many times we try to do it on our own. Come on, how many of y'all are guilty? Come on, the guy in the back has two hands and a foot lift. <laughs> but the enemy is real crafty. He wants to try to lie to you in this season and say, 
you're the only one going through this. God's not with you. You're going to fall apart. Everything is falling apart. This marriage is over. Your money is over. This is going to ruin you. The truth is he wants to make us better. I remember being at my father-in-law's house, and next door to him was a guy who had the greatest garden I'd ever seen in my life. Like, I honestly had never seen a garden this nice, and, and I'm not a garden enthusiast, but I was intrigued, so I went out and was looking at it, and he came out like, hey, excuse me, what are you doing? I was like, hey, easy. I'm just, he's like, don't touch anything. I was like, just add a pepper. <laughs> okay. I'm not really, but <laughs> maybe. <laughs> and I began to ask him, man, what's your secret? What's your secret to this amazing garden? Did you angle it a certain way so that sun would hit it? Did you angle it a certain way so that, that, that the, the, the time of day would just light up the path? Did you import certain soil to put in? Did you water it with special artesian water? And he's like, slow down, man. And I was like, man, what is your secret? And he said, I'll wait every day. And he got, you could tell, like, he knew I was impressed. So he got a little puffed up and a little mumbly. He was like, I'll weed every day. And I said, you do? He said, I'll weed every day. I said, you win every day. He said, I'll weed every day. I said, you're winning every single day. He said, I'll weed every day. I said, you smoke weed every day. I don't know what you're saying. I can't, because that's not why I'm out here. He said, no, man, I weed every day. Now, again, how many other gardeners in the room? Come on, you like to garden a little bit. Bless you. <laughs> I don't have time yet, but I want to. He said, no, man, I don't have to pull weeds every day because I don't garden. I said, you have to pull weeds every day? What a high maintenance deal. He said, no, 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 I don't have to pull weeds every day, but I check for weeds every day. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, this is the problem with the body of Christ. We're not checking for weeds anymore. We've allowed toxic noise, toxic things, toxic relationships. We've allowed weeds in our lives that dis disguise themselves as good fruit. You know a weed's job is to do one thing. It's to strangle. It's to restrict Bible says, John 15, 5, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Remain in me and I in you. The enemy knows if I can cramp off, clamp off, cut off access to the heart of God, then he knows ultimately he wins. And if he can rip you off, he not only rips you off, but he rips all the people off that are connected to your purpose and your destiny. The truth is in this waiting season, number two, God wants to make us better, but we have to stay connected to the vine and last but not least, we have to recognize in the middle of all of this, number three, he will provide. How many of y'all he has provided? Come on. It might be in the area of joy or peace. I talked to someone the other day and they said, man, everything and our finances look bleak and messy. But I'm telling you, I have peace like I've never experienced before. The truth is, in the middle of the waiting season, God will provide. But the truth is, we have to pull these weeds, and every weed we pull, we make room for a seed. God will provide, and he will show up and do everything that he's promised he will do. I said this a moment ago, that he did not build us to panic. He did not, he, he did not build us to carry this. It's our choice to panic or not. He, he did not build us to stress out about it. The Bible actually says this in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. And seven, don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let your petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns. And before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good will come and this part right here blesses me, will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. Whatever you're lacking, Whatever you're in need of, I believe the good, good Father is going to provide. I said this earlier, that the promises of God, they don't break when you lean on them. I want to challenge you and encourage you. And I believe right now, come on, will you stand your feet? Uh, we're bringing this in for a landing. Come on, just lift your hands for just a moment. We may not be able to get out of this current season we're in. But the truth is, God can get in the middle of it with us. Holy Spirit, this is my prayer. We go back to your word and we remind you of your word. We remind you of your promises. This last part, he will provide. God, you said in your word in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, that you will supply all of our needs 
according to your riches and glory. God, I pray for favor. I pray for increase. I pray, God, for a shift, a shifting in the narrative of their lives, God, where this is the week that we brag and boast on three years from now, five years from now. That was the week that God showed up. Maybe you've been furloughed. Maybe financially things have been crazy for you. Maybe you're in the middle of a physical need. Maybe you have been walking through this waiting season and you're walking through a, a, a physical issue, a physical stronghold. Maybe there has been instability in your home. Maybe mentally you're struggling. Holy Spirit, I'm asking that you would show up and you would breathe. Holy Spirit, show up and move. And God, I pray right now for peace that we would surrender panic. Peace right now, Holy Spirit, where we would lay it at your feet. That God, shape and mold us. God, anything in our lives, would you just shift your attention from here to open-handed like we said earlier? Would you just allow God to do some weeding today? Would you ask him to pull some things out of your life that maybe have been standing in the way, maybe a distraction Y'all, this might be a relationship issue. This might be things that you've been allowing in your ears and your eyes, some things that you know you need to let go and surrender. Would you just begin right now to just let go and with an open-handed posture, just ask God, God, remove these weeds right now. Remove these re weeds right now. And God, we're gonna shift and we're gonna turn our worry into worship because we know, God, that you can turn our battle, the thing we've been walking through, into a breakthrough. So God, do some weeding right now. Pull some things out of our lives and we surrender. We surrender it all. We surrender it all. We surrender it all. I feel peace. The Bible says in Numbers chapter six, verse 24 through 26, it says, may the Lord bless you. See, in that blessing, there's favor. May he keep you. See, there's protection. Make his face to shine upon you. There's mercy and grace. Be gracious to you. The word gracious literally means to grant you favor. Turn his countenance towards you. He literally, the body language, the person of Jesus is shifting his attention towards you. There's restoration in that. And at the very end, it says, may he give you peace. There's rest in that. Let's just stay here for just a moment. If you need healing in your physical body, will you lift your hands right now? Everybody else put your hands down just for a minute. We're bringing in for a landing, I promise. I just feel like the Lord said he's reversing diagnoses right now. I'm not trying to hyper-spiritualize this, but we believe that the healer is still healing. Come on. And, and that, that verse that I quoted a moment ago that became Jackie's anthem in the middle of her storm in Isaiah 58, 8, just as sure, if you need healing, lift your hands right now. Father, just as sure as the sun will rise, health and strength is springing forth speedily. But I feel that right now, that every fiber, every tissue, every organ, every blood cell, every nerve, every tendon, every bone from the top of your head to the soles of your feet, God is shifting and healing and restoring. I feel right now that God, right now you're reversing diabetes in somebody. Right now, in the name of Jesus, you may be watching online. Don't be surprised if the next time you go back to the doctor, they say, we don't know what happened, but you no longer have this. I thank you, Lord God, that you're healing cardiovascular issues, congestive heart issues, valves are clearing out right now, irregular heartbeats, heart murmurs, birth defects being healed right now in the name of Jesus. I thank you, God. Someone who's on di dialysis, kidneys being healed, Right now, in the name of Jesus, bodies are lining up. Health and strength springing forth speedily. The righteousness of God going out in front of you and the glory of the Lord overtaking you. God, I thank you that the name of Jesus will always be bigger than the name of cancer. God, I thank you that tumors are disappearing right now. Nodules and growths. Tumors, whether they're benign or they're Malignant, I pray right now for healing power. Shrink them. Eradicate them. Let every cell line up with your word. Let blood cells line up with your word. I pray, God, that lupus is broken off. 
right now in the name of Jesus. Chronic pain, fibromyalgia, broken off. Chronic pain, rheumatoid arthritis, breaking off. Back pain, right now, break it. Y'all, we're in the middle of a Holy Ghost moment. Now you can jump in. Knees and joints being healed right now. I was in a service, y'all. We were leading worship, and I was back in the back, and I'm not just dropping names to drop it, but I was standing next to my friend, and I was leading worship with one of the most dynamic worship leaders on the planet, uh, Miss Tasha Cobbs Leonard, and, and we, were, we were singing together, and she was kind of letting me sing with her because she's amazing. And, and uh, the pastor was up here, and he said this out loud. He said, somebody's knee is being healed right now. And he said, start doing this. Start doing this. Now, what he didn't know was I had had a meniscus, ACL, and MCL tear years before and had all kinds of struggles and issues with this right knee. And I'm telling you, I'm standing next to Tasha, and we begin to sing. Here is my worship, all of my worship. Receive my worship, all of my worship. And I'm telling you, the whole room began to lift their voices. And I just started doing this. And y'all, I went like this, and this loud pop happened to the point where Tasha said, oh, are you okay? And from that moment on, I've never had any more knee issues. God showed up and healed me. Because when Jesus is in the room, things change. When Jesus is in the room, stories change. So come on, do y'all know that song? Here is my worship, all of my worship, receive my worship, all of my worship, here is my, here is my worship. to not panic. We choose to let you shape and mold us to get out of the way. John chapter 3 verse 30 allow you to increase and become greater and greater as we decrease. And we recognize as your kids that you're going to follow through and you're going to provide everything we need when we need it. God, I thank you that doctor reports are going to come back, that they're going to go home today and realize that growth is gone that they're gonna realize that pain had left their body, that mental stability and emotional healing has happened. And we brag and we boast and we shout from the rooftops that you are better than good to us. Come on right now, can you give God praise? Now come on, praise him like he already healed you. Praise him like he already restored you. Y'all, I was blessed to be invited by your pastor to come. And I pray that y'all were blessed today. And I pray that you'll leave here. Number one, I want you to write on a sticky note and throw it on your mirror. Check for weeds every day. Just be searching and make sure there's nothing by the, at the enemy's hand trying to get in and smother out or muddy the waters of who God is in your life. And then every day, every chance you have to turn your worry into worship, recognize that God will turn your battle into a breakthrough. Y'all believe that today? Come on one more time. Here is my worship.